today we did a long life ceremony for my teacher, Tessa Yamamoto Roshi. So I've been thinking a lot about him and his example and his teachings. My teacher um, this week has had a had a stroke and is in the hospital. From what we know, it seems like he's stable, but I don't know yet. I don't have news about the long-term um, prognosis. I do know that according to my Dharma sister, Kashu, he's more concerned about other people than himself. He was worried about me and my Dharma brother and his sister and the temple and hoping that the temple was okay. And this to me seems very characteristic of my teacher. It's characteristic of him because this is the center of his life, meaning in this time of illness, he doesn't have to act differently than he's acted every other time in his life. The way he acts now is reflective of the way he always is. And this is just how he is. So I'm not surprised at all that he would be more concerned for others than himself because he's always like that. Um, he's a very kind person and not showy. Oh, he keeps his kindness quiet and just does it. He's very steady in his practice, but he doesn't really talk about it to everybody. He just does it. He wakes up every morning and does zazen and does service. He does service at noon. He does service in the afternoon. He just does that as the way of life that he's cultivated over these um, nearly 80 years, I bet especially the more than 50 years since he's been ordained. And this is a good motivation for us. You know, we have so much going on in the world around us right now. We can want some sort of a fix or some sort of a magical solution to everything. But the truth is the way we will respond to the situation of the world around us is the way that we will respond to everything, hopefully with our practice. But what does that mean? What is our practice? <laughs> What does it mean to respond appropriately? And how can we know? How can we know? Lama Atisha has a saying um, from the Bodhisattva. Um, what is it? The uh, treasure garland. That when we are in the midst of many, Let's keep a check on our speech. When we're remaining alone, let's keep a check on our mind. When in the midst of many, let me keep a check on my speech. When remaining alone, let me keep a check on my mind. Well, where is your mind? When we're alone or when we're sitting zazen in silence, it's easy to see our mind because we're quiet. It doesn't mean that it's easy to um, control our mind or to attend to the fluctuations of mind, but we have this silent opportunity to do this right in front of us. So we can apply diligent efforts and really learn to work with our mind. This is of the utmost importance. We've been talking about obstacles on the path. And last week I spoke about hidden treasures on the path, which are the difficulties that we face. 
And somebody this week told me they had realized the obstacle. And they said, Tenku, I figured this out. The obstacle is me. And really, there's a lot to be said there. There's a lot to learn there. You know, Shanti Deva says, why try to cover the entire earth in shoe leather when we can cover our own feet? Attending to our mind, our own mind, is covering our own feet. When we attend to our own mind, we can meet any situation that comes up, even a war even arguments, even disagreements with dear friends, we can meet whatever comes up when we attend to our own mind. But if we expect the world to change around us according to how we think it should be, that is never going to happen. Never. So how seriously do we really take our disturbing emotions, our anger, our hatred, our disturbances, our fears, our anxieties. How seriously do we really take those? Do we bring those into our practice on purpose with a strong intention? Or do we say, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. Or, you know, that's fine, but really this person is just really pissing me off. Yeah. How seriously are we going to take it? This is my question for all of us today. How seriously? If we say that person's an idiot, they don't know what they're talking about then we've already stretched out of neutral and created a negative feeling toward that person, whoever it is. Can we come back to neutral? Just people around us, even those we do not agree with, are humans just like us who want to be happy and don't want to suffer. This is an essential universal truth. All beings want to be happy and don't want to suffer. So how can we take that spaciousness into hearing things we don't agree with us? We have to start by truly hearing on one hand and on the other hand by letting go of the me, the ego at the center of our own self-centered views, which is easier said than done. This week, I've been, or maybe the past few weeks, I've been very intentionally listening to or reading um, accounts of people's personal views on the war in Israel and Gaza. And then there was there also the responses in the United States, people from all different perspectives. And I've found that it's easy, you might, you might not be surprised, but I found that it's very easy to listen to those that I agree with and challenging to stay present to those that I don't. This week, I was listening to an interview with somebody from who supports the um who supports Hamas and listening to them with an open mind just freely listening this is their perspective this is how they see the world this is a historical view from their point of view was challenging because i kept wanting to argue with them no but 
that's, you know, okay, that's fine, but you left out this part or you left out this part. And each time I had to bring myself back to center in order to openly hear what they were saying. And by the end of the interview, I found that I had learned things. I had heard a perspective that I didn't know very well, a perspective that I thought I knew. And maybe the end result was the words out of his mouth. Maybe they weren't that different from what I thought I knew, but hearing it from another person was a different experience than reading about it. So listening to him fully, staying present, really gave me a sense of spaciousness and care. And I am very grateful for that. Perhaps challenging and our only choice. On the one hand, listening fully without judgment. And on the other hand, letting go of the me in the middle, letting go of the self-cherishing of our own ego, our own opinions, our own idea that we know better, that we know best. Letting go of our judgments and also letting go of that smug smile that we all do when we read something or hear something that we agree with. Yeah, they're right. They are right. In other words, I am right. So tempting. What do we know? Especially if it's not our own country. Why do we have such strong opinions? What if we came back into attending and listening and caring for everyone in the universe? When we practice, when we practice metta or loving kindness, or when we chant, especially chanting dharanis for protection, they take away the space for our own views. A friend of mine was talking about this this week, and I appreciated his perspective. When we're chanting, when we're truly practicing with no me at the center, in whatever way that is, sitting zazen in silence, but a little easier when we're chanting because our voice can fill up literally everything. When we're really chanting fully, just putting it out there, our voice fills up. There's no space for our own views to come in. And this is helpful because on one hand, sending out the wish for all beings to be happy, for all beings to have what we need, the food, the water, the safe place to sleep, the protection, the kindness, all beings want to be happy and don't want to suffer. So really sending out that wish without discrimination fills up everything and leaves us no space for our own views. And this in turn helps us because the more we have our own views and our own opinions or our own afflictive emotions, the more negative karma we create for ourselves. The more we're stuck, the more we get stuck. The more we have a view, the more our view becomes the only view. We have to back off of that and come into a spaciousness, an openness to hearing different perspectives. And this applies in all different situations. Right now, there's so many tensions and opinions about the war, but we can do this for anything. A friend said that the solution is 
we have to learn more. We need to learn more about the Middle East. We need to learn. We need to read more. And on one hand, I really, I do agree with this. Why not? Why not learn more? Why not open our minds? And the opposite is true, too. We need to unknow what we think we know so that we can have space for different perspectives. We need to let go of our firmly held opinions and views and the opinions and views that are influenced by our fears, by our anger, by our judgments, and come back into neutral. Just people. All people want to be happy and don't want to suffer. Our bodhisattva vow is not to help others who are like us. Not to live for the beings of, not to live for the benefit of those beings who agree with me. It's to live for the benefit of all beings, wherever they might be. When I first went back to my teacher for ordination, I had been in a place where one of the teachers treated me with unkindness. And I, in particular, one incident had happened recently, right before I went back to my teacher. And at that time, um, my Japanese skills were rusty. I hadn't spoken Japanese much in a while. And I was trying to get him to understand how much pain I was in. Sorry. And he was so patient. I remember exactly where he was sitting, where I was sitting. I remember the quality of the light in the room. And he was so patient with me. And he was trying to understand what I was saying. And he kept saying, you know, he kept indicating he was listening. He was listening. And then he understood. And, you know, I told him as best I could the story of the hurt. And, you know, because at that time my language skills were weak, that was probably a blessing because I didn't get into the, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, but really got into the essence of the hurt. And he showed so much compassion to me. And I was so grateful. But he didn't really answer my question. And so then I was like, but what should I do about this? What should I do? Should I talk to them? Should I go and, you know, tell somebody? What should I do? And he said, every now and then my teacher, um, when something's very important, he can break out some English. So he said, you must wish for them satori, which means enlightenment. I said, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, you know, I think, I think this person may be not yet satori. Maybe not yet. Maybe this person isn't yet enlightened. Therefore, you should wish for them with everything you've got for them to be enlightened. This is what he told me. No story, no retribution, no nothing except meeting them fully with practice, because what more could be of benefit 
than to wish for this person who had really hurt me to be fully enlightened. If they were, if they are, then maybe they won't hurt somebody else. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. But the solution came back to me. How am I going to meet the situation? And I took what he said to heart and really, really took that advice very seriously and practiced in that way, wishing with every fiber of my being for this person to be enlightened, practicing for their benefit as well as my benefit, practicing really single-mindedly with a lot of dedication. I was very motivated by what he told me. And what I found is that my hurt softened and I found more space. And I found that this person's treatment of me didn't really do anything to me when I stopped letting it. In other words, I became free of them through practice, through letting go of the me at the center. Shanti Deva, in talking about anger, says that anger anger doesn't have arms or legs. Anger is neither brave nor wise. So why is it that anger has made me its slave? Anger and craving have neither legs nor arms, are neither brave nor wise. How is it that they've made me their slave? How is that? That anger, judgment, fear, ill will have made us their slave. When we come back to a more spacious view, when we come back to letting go of our ego in our silence and in groups, when we're not alone, watching our speech, then we can find a way through. Watching our speech, the reminders of right speech. Is it the right time to say this? Do I speak the truth? What is the truth anyway? Do I speak the truth? Do I speak gently and not harshly? Is what I'm saying beneficial or necessary? And do I speak with a kind heart and from a place of goodwill? Do I speak with goodwill? Is it the right time? Is it true? Is my speech gentle and not harsh? Is it necessary? And do I speak from kindness and goodwill? Having asked ourselves this when we're in public gives us a guideline for how to be with each other, even in disagreement. I want to suggest that yelling, that arguing on the internet, that arguing through the use of short two to three sentence conclusions or memes is not right speech. It's one way, it's strong, it can be harsh, and it doesn't allow hearing. 
it's one-sided. We have to be willing to listen, not only to those we agree with, but to everybody. Many, many years ago, when I was at a temple in California, in residence there, and a layperson, a war broke out, and it was quite disturbing. And I was so upset by the idea of America's response to September 11th to respond to killing with more killing. And I wanted to go out into the streets of San Francisco and join the protests that were happening. They felt so full of energy. There were so many people in the streets, just as far as you could see people out there. And I asked my practice leader at that time if I could go and join. And he was hesitant, but he did not hold me back. He said, go, but keep silence. Learn how to find peace in the middle of that. Don't join in the yelling. Don't join in any things that are violent and see what you learn. I would say the same to you. If you feel the need to join in any vigil, protest, whatever is going on, wear your Roksu if you have one and let that be your guide for how you want to show up. Don't yell, walk in silence, sending out loving kindness to all around you and notice what you learn. What I learned in that time was that I could be present, that I could be present in a way that did not require giving into anger, that I could have conviction without anger. And there was a time in that where I was in the crowd, keeping silence, and a guy picked up a full water bottle. I'll pretend this is a water bottle. And you can know that that wasn't light. That thing was heavy. And the water bottle was frozen. He picked it up. He had it in his hand. He pulled his hand back. And he was getting ready to throw it at one of the police officers. The police officers were standing there with their shields um, preventing people from getting onto the freeway. Pulls it back. And in that moment, with no forethought at all, I went to the guy and I touched him on the shoulder gently. And I said, hey, could you not do that? And he was like, Oh, okay. And he put it down. So simple. Not a guaranteed outcome. But if I had also been yelling, the guaranteed outcome would have been to, for him to throw it. We can't know what's going to happen. We can't know the best response. We can't know how what we're going to do. And we can't meet the moment if we are not meeting ourselves. We can't meet the moment if we're so full of our own ego that we can't be present to everything around us. But on the other side of that, if we can keep our mind in check, if we can keep our speech in check, then we can meet whatever comes our way. 
This much I know. So I encourage you to take this into the world around you as you meet this moment and really meet this moment. There's no need to check out. Meet it, but meet it with spaciousness and meet it with practice. And above all, wish with every fiber of your being, may my practice benefit all sentient beings. Enacting our bodhisattva vows, not for the sake of me, but for everyone in the universe, leaving no one out. May all beings realize satori. May all beings be enlightened. In this way, we can meet all circumstances.